Welcome back to the Bob Fu Report, where we give you stories from the front lines in China regarding human rights, religious freedom, and rule of law. My name is Jonathan Dingler, filling in for Bob this week. As most of you know, we like to dive into the details of a lot of stories regarding these issues, giving you a personal glance at、um, the Chinese Communist Party's oppression of house church Christians, Tibetans, Uyghurs, and many religious minorities in China. However, today we want to take a broad look at another central issue. We've talked about many issues here on our show before, including、uh, freedom of speech,、um, forced、uh, disappearance, forced organ harvesting. There's so many issues that plague、um, communist China, but one of them, and one of the most important ones as of late, has been forced labor. Now we have covered this topic pretty extensively here on the Bob Fu Report. But we wanted to give you a new perspective, some more expert opinions on forced labor in China, and maybe more of a practical look at what you can do as a consumer. This year, China Aid attended the International Religious Freedom Summit, also known as the Earth Summit, in Washington D.C. Other religious freedom groups from around the world met with varying focuses. Some of them are like China Aid; they focus on a specific country or area. Others focus on a specific religion that is oppressed. So while some of these events were going on, many of them were meeting and having panel discussions.、Uh, at the same time, China Aid founder and, of course, the host of the show, Bob Fu, led a discussion on how to keep corporations accountable for forced labor in China, namely for Uyghur forced labor. But there's so many religious minorities that are under this constant.、Um, Pressure from the Communist Party and are forced to、uh, make labor for most of the time Western co-、uh, companies. The panelists for this discussion included former ambassador to the UN Economic and Social Council Kelly Curry, as well as Jua Ilang.、Uh, she's with the Coalition to End Uyghur Forced Labor. And finally, the last panelist, last but not least, was Shi Ming Lei. We've had her here on the program before. Her husband Chen Yuan was sentenced to five years in prison because he used to be a human rights defender for、uh, an NGO in China,、uh, and she found out last year that during his stay in a、uh, labor camp that he was used for forced labor for Milwaukee Tool. You can find out more information about Shi Ming Lei on our website about Chen Yuan. You can also even send him、uh, a letter、uh, on our website. But let's tune in to the panel and see what these experts have to say about forced labor in China.、Um, I know that that、um, my fellow panelists are going to talk about various aspects of how, as as consumers and as actors in the marketplace and people of faith, we can help to、um, ensure that we are not supporting the、um, repression of, of other people of faith and other and other human beings. In, Back in in China,、um, and through the, by supporting the Chinese Party State and its ability to use、um, Western capital and Western、um, investor dollars, as well as our consumer spending, to support its repression.、Um, I'm going to talk very specifically about one aspect of this, which is how the Chinese Communist Party leverages capital markets, especially the United States capital markets. By capital markets, I mean Wall Street,、um, and I, you know, for all of, for many of us in this room, that means our retirement savings, our four hundred one k's, our、um, our IRAs, and anything else that we invest in in stock in the stock market. The Chinese Communist Party、um, is able to benefit from our free and open markets by getting its companies by getting Chinese companies listed on U.S. stock exchanges. There are nearly there are more than 200 Chinese companies that are currently listed on U.S. stock exchanges right now that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange and Nasdaq that are able to access our broad and deep capital markets, which are the, the most liquid and the largest in the world. Now, what this means is that they're able to get capital relatively cheaply, and it means that U.S. investors technically can buy pieces of these companies. 
But the problem is, well, there are several problems. First of all, these companies are not private companies in the sense that <coughs> GE or Apple or other companies that you're buying in the stock market are private companies. They, the Chinese Communist Party owns what's called golden shares in each one of these companies. And any important company operating in China today, the party state owns not just, they may own the small piece share rise number, the number may be small, but they're called golden shares because they allow the party to control the company. And I want to say that again. They may own 1%. These golden shares may be 1% of the, the equity stake in these companies, but because they are these golden shares, they allow the Chinese Communist Party to ultimately control what happens to that country, company. The other thing that the Chinese Communist Party does is it restricts these companies from sharing their audit reports and their financial reports with our stock regulators. Every other company that is listed on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or any of our exchanges has to provide certain reports to the Securities and Exchange Commission. Chinese companies do not. The U.S. passed a law of, um, several years ago called the Holy Foreign Companies Accountable Act that was supposed to remedy this problem. But unfortunately, the agency of the U.S. government that's responsible for that, administering that law, has cut a deal, another bad deal with the Chinese Communist Party that allows these companies to once again circumvent our our laws, our securities law, that every other company has to abide by. And they're, because, and by just giving them some things in Hong Kong and not giving them full access. So we don't really know what's really going on inside these companies. And that gets to the third problem, which is that most of them are set up through what's called a variable interest entity. And I'm throwing a lot of financial terms at you, but the whole point of this is that, you know, you buy a share in a company, you think you have an ownership stock, you don't. You're giving them your money, your hard-earned retire hard retirement savings, or money for your kid's college fund for something that really is nothing. And they are using it to then build up these companies that unfairly compete against our companies, and in some cases are involved in grave violations of human rights, which um, my colleague, Joyer, and others will talk about today. Because some of these companies that are on our exchanges are on what's called the entity list for commerce. Again, Charter will talk about this more. Or other lists that the US government has compiled that says that they've been complicit in gross violations of human rights. They can be blacklisted by the US government from procurement, by the Department of Defense, or put on an entity list as complicit in forced, in forced labor of uh, older people and complicity in the Cuban genocide. But you can still buy their stocks in the stock market through mutual funds and over the and, and by going to your broker and say, I want to buy stock in this company, you can still do that. So there's this very bizarre misalignment in our laws that allows capital markets and these companies to continue to take advantage of our capital markets, even if they are restricted from doing other things with our government. This is even a problem for I used to work in the federal government and my thrift savings plan, which is our 401 k is still invested in some of these companies. This is the US government's 401k, and we still can't get these companies out of our 401ks. So this yes. is something where we've had to, you know, I've gone to my own investment advisor. If you have, you need to go to your investment advisor and say, please tell me what my exposure is to Chinese companies. And it's important, and we can talk about specific ones. I can give you more granular detail um, in the Q&A if that's something you're interested in. But this is one of the biggest sources of wealth that the Chinese Communist Party has, that they take advantage of, and hard open free society. And then it also allows them to manipulate these big Wall Street banks and turn, turn them into their allies. So China, the Chinese Communist Party's biggest allies in the United States are BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, Fidelity, these big Wall Street companies, because even if they're selling these garbage products, which they know they are, they want to be able to sell over-the-counter equities to Chinese people, 1.4 billion Chinese investors. So they're willing to take a loss and sell Americans a, de a defective product, essentially, in order to be able to access the Chinese market and, and make it so that they can make up, make up, um, that's the word I'm going to suck up to the Chinese Communist yeah. Party um, yeah. in order to get market access. So this is, 
you know, this is a really serious problem that we're just starting to tackle in this in human rights space. Um, I'm working with a great coalition of organizations, several of which are representing here today, to try to tackle this. But it's something that as consumers and as investors, we all have a role in tackling. We all know, of course, uh, the, uh, the Communist Party is kind of uh, using the Western technology to go, I mean, to enable impoverished and partially really uh, contribute to these uh, atrocities. Uh, I remembered uh, just um, uh, a few months ago when I got a phone call from a group of uh, exiled Chinese uh, Christians in South Korea and uh, one of the elders' uh, parents were kidnapped and uh, basically the Chinese state security said uh, Ask him in South Korea to turn on his WeChat account, actively so that he can be uh, globally positioned uh, for potential kidnapping. And each of the Uyghur you know, farmers, right, uh, are asked to uh, receive a government smartphone. Of course, it's installed. And it's not only the civilians' technology, but also Really, nowadays, the U.S. technology such as uh, ECMO, you know, is being exported to China and used for massive organ harvesting. Organ harvesting, of course, is being used in all the uh, different ethnicities and uh, from uh, Xinjiang to Tibet. And uh, so I want to uh, maybe raise this first question uh, to our panelists. Um, what should we, I mean, go for better, uh, you know, to base uh, Western technologies on civilians and others? And, um, you know, the law uh, we have enacted in Congress, and um, how can it be improved? Um, obviously, it's not $1.6 billion, right? Uh, I ask a Walmart uh, executive so how long will it take to mold the supply chain from China. He said 53 years. Now that was a private dinner uh, and with the Walmart executives. So please. Investor, yeah. Again, and for, from my perspective, the, the money that we provide through US capital markets and through other Western capital markets is the lifeblood that sustains the Chinese Communist Party. We have, because our, our savings and our investment funds go to fuel their economic growth and allow them to expand and expand into overseas markets and build factories and, and, and advance um, research and development, let alone steal U.S. technology, which they do um, quite, quite frequently. Um, and this is, this is how they're able to grow these, these companies because they don't have the same access to, to capital in, in China that they do um, to make their global brands. They, they really need US, US capital. Um, and so it's, it's up to us as investors to make sure that we are not you know, providing that and that we are not writing down the fuel. The other thing that our capital market has done is, is bail them out from the consequences of their bad governance and their mistakes. Um, no, you know, no other communist party has been able to be as successful as the Chinese Communist Party because they have not had access to Western investment the way that the Chinese Communist Party has. We didn't invest in the former Soviet Union and provide them with trillions of dollars in capital to help them develop their industry. We've done that in China. We have created this environment that has allowed them to develop these companies and grow these businesses that are then not only destroying our industrial base, making, you know, creating a level playing field for global trade, but also perpetrating these mass human rights violations. And so it's not only economically disadvantaged, disadvantaging the United States and other, other countries, including developing countries that can't compete with this model of development, but it also is a, it's a moral stain on all of us that we are providing funding and the, the fuel the fuel. We, we as investors have the power to go to our investment managers and our, you know, our pension fund managers and say, stop. 
just stop. We do not want to, to invest our money in these, you know, in these genocidal businesses. Yeah, any thoughts? Yeah. Um, uh, there are several points I'd like to address. So first, I'd like well, can you there hear me? Oh. Um, there are a few points I'd like to address. Um, first, I'd like to say that oftentimes people make operating uh, uh, mix the concept of operating in China equals bad. So I like to address that. Oftentimes, as a labor rights organization, we do not encourage companies to exit a country or a region completely. And it is our first time that we encourage or encourage a law to, to, to ban production of, of, uh, of an entire region and, and, and of like all goods. And it is our first time basically saying that, well, there's no other way you will have to exit for a company to actually ensure they are uh, 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 enforcing, I mean, they are operating in an ethical, like their only way to, to, to make sure of that is by exiting the Uyghur region completely. But that's not oftentimes the case. So I like to uh, just reiterate that. So when you see labor rights uh, mistreatments and um, uh, mispractices, we do not automatically uh, encourage people to leave because that's bad for the workers. But in the Uyghur region's case, because even when uh, uh, companies stay, when factories remain, Uyghur workers, well, Uyghur prisoners or camp detainees who are forced to work in factories, no matter what, how companies think they are protecting the human rights of those so-called workers, it is not really helping because the beneficiaries are the is the Chinese government, and therefore the only way for companies to know. So whenever companies say we're doing everything we can to do our due diligence and we're doing everything, we can, uh, yeah, so that's not the point, and uh, it is not going to help. The only way for them to know that they are doing the right thing is by leaving. And unfortunately, we don't. Oftentimes, we don't want that to happen. We don't want to leave workers to be jobless. But when we're talking about Uyghur people. They're the ones who had perfect jobs before that they chose in their own wheel. They could be um, medical doctors or soccer players or teachers, but they're work. They are forced to get uh, trains for uh, you know threading or, or working on mills and then to, to make different kinds of uh, garment pieces. Or like uh, Ms. Ishmael's husband working to make um, gloves. And prison labor is happening. It's, it's a rent and practice happening in, in, in China. And so, so I. Therefore, I'd like to stress that besides corporations should do their part in providing their supply chain transparency down to the raw material levels, the U.S. government should also, you know, uh, really, as I stated in my uh, speech earlier, should enforce this uh, U.S. LPA in, uh, rigorous, rigorously and adding, expanding the current entity list. There are only a few dozens, uh, a couple of dozens of names listed on entity list. What's the difference between uh, the companies that are listed on the entity list. What does it mean when it's, so people might think, oh, it's UFLP, and they're, they're not gonna come in from the Uyghur region anyway, anyways, why do you need it to be on the entity list? So once a, a company that are that is listed on the entity list, it doesn't matter if their products are coming in from the Uyghur region. Even if they're coming in from Mexico, they're coming in from Indonesia, If as long as this company was listed on the list, they cannot, export their goods, they cannot uh, have their goods be shipped into the U.S. border. So it's really important that the CBP expand this list because there are hundreds of names out there that's totally deserving to be on that list right now. And it, uh, I know that civil society groups have already submitted such a list and it could really help. Um, I believe it can really help with the force of our issues. Yeah. Thank you, Dora. I, I forgot actually to um, share with our, our um, perhaps uh, she's, uh, you guys already know, uh, that Dora is also the daughter of um, perhaps the, the most prominent person of conscience of the Uyghurs, uh, the father, Professor Ilham um, uh, Tuhti. Uh, he says, has been served life sentence as a peaceful Uyghur scholar. Life sentence still there, so we need to pray for his grief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
my work um, when, uh, when I was in China before my husband arrested, um, my work is uh, global e-commerce director, and I also served in the benefit company as a supply chain director for one year. So um, actually, um, Milwaukee took uh, company and also Home Depot, and then they all reply uh, my email. Uh, they reply and they said, uh, we, we do not tolerate any kind of forced labor. And we have supply chain um, standards, and we have a regular, a regular audit, but that's just the way they are saying on the paper. So um, what I want to address, uh, there are two items. The first one is, um, is a business company, they all commit their social responsibility and they have their standards, but they just, they just don't follow their standards. So uh, there should be regulation and, and compliance force them to, uh, to apply uh, this social responsibility they commit in their uh, business. The second is um, the CBP. Uh, I checked I uh, used my only one year supply chain experience and I, I checked all the data, uh, trying to find pieces of data. Of course, it's hard for me for an uh, individual. But I do find some data, like in import data, and, then, and there's some uh, uh, public data on their supplier, Milwaukee to supplier. That company was seeking an IPO in, in China and it has a public document. I read all their financial report, everything, and I, I, found, I found that company, they have Chinese army background. Mm -hmm. so, so that's my question. So how do the U.S. companies do their audit? Mm -hmm. How the U.S. government, the CDP, you know, when, when, the, when the goods come to the States, and how you review um, and try, try to figure out and after I reported to the uh, CDP and Homeland Security, and after I uh, sent out the proofs to these companies, and how they will take action, actually, it's, I think it's quite, it's a, it's a, it's a, issue, it's a issue that um, probably the policymakers need to consider, uh, like how you make the yeah, policy can apply in the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I want to start uh, specifically with recognizing my good friend and uh, who actually helped draft the uh, Weaker uh, Force Labor <laughs> Prevention Act, Dr. Scott Lucy, uh, from the CDC. Uh, that's, that's off the record. <laughs> okay, uh, one more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, our tiny CEO, uh, Chad Bullard, is also here, and uh, uh, she has a uh, long uh, federal law enforcement experience. Uh, I think uh, that will add our uh, Chinese uh, power to uh, to help in the last freedom. Um, we have about like four minutes left. Uh, maybe just uh, one quick question. Uh, yeah. Is there your name? Yes, uh, always dangerous to give the mic to a rabbi. Uh, I'm Rabbi Abraham Cooper. I'm the vice chair of USERF and also at the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, uh, number one, about, I guess now 10 days or two weeks ago, a distinguished group of 30 Muslim leaders went to Xinjiang. I happen to know two of the people who met and went from the Gulf, very respected a religious, uh, interfaith, and politically connected people who unfortunately gave a clean bill of health uh, to, um, to the Chinese Communist government. Uh, I'd like to hear the reflections of everyone on the panel, including the moderator. But my second question is, this is the International Religious Forum. So, and if I, I missed it, I apologize. But specifically, what would you suggest to people who represent a specific church group, a synagogue, a temple, a mosque, what can your neighbors hear who are directly involved and in leaders within their own faith communities? What do you need them to do? 
and how should they do it? Thank you. Yeah, so, so we have a short time, but uh, thank you, uh, Wilson. We need to re recognize Rabbi Cooper for his contribution and work for his freedom. And uh, let's have a each panelist. Have a <laughs> um, I'll, take, I'll take the second question because, again, um, communities that they are involved in the marketplace, you are your marketplace actors. You have universities that are affiliated with religious traditions that have endowments that invest in the stock market. You have your churches and your synagogues and your mosques. All, you know, many of these um, religious institutions have revolving funds or mutual funds that they invest in for their, their personnel or you know, just to maintain the, you, know, you put your your contributions and your, your funds for your religious institutions into the stock market to get returns on them. And the faith community has a long history of supporting socially, social corporate responsibility and, and getting involved in pushing the market to be more um, humanistic in its, in its responsibilities and pushing corporate social responsibility. This is no different from that. Um, and, and so I think as market actors, people of faith do should you know, talk to your investment advisor, make sure that you are that your investments are not complicit in, and not going to companies that are are supporting um, forced labor practices or not complicit in these. The information is out there, it's not secret, it's publicly available. There are highly credible reports coming from many people in this room. Um, including um, many faith-based NGOs that do research on these issues. And the information is there. Um, and, and the federal government is also doing some of this, but just making sure that your investment dollars are not going to support these companies is the most, and, and being vocal about it. Being, being active as shareholders also is really important, making your voices heard.